It's good to be uh, with you all again. It's um, something that I always uh, look forward to when I have an opportunity to do so. Let's turn with me to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I just want to talk to us this morning about the God of hope. Um, we are living in uh, uh, some very interesting times. You know, sometimes it takes a uh, a prophetic insight to discern that we're living in, 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 in interesting times. And sometimes it's just plain old obvious. And, uh, and uh, we are in one of those times where it's just plain old obvious. You know, and uh, uh, things happen and things happen in different uh, times and seasons. And sometimes it happens with uh, a greater amount of intensity and frequency. Um, sometimes it happens with a greater uh, frequency and scope. And what I mean by that is where uh, sometimes it just happens on a national level and we're just aware of that. And sometimes it just seems like it's happening at a national level and globally and all at the same time. And, uh, and those are the kinds of things that have been happening you know, over the course of the last month in particular. Just things have just gotten heightened um, nationally and, um, and globally as well. And so uh, undoubtedly, I know that I wrestle with uh, these feelings, you know, where I find myself at times my heart getting overwhelmed, and, uh, and I'm sure that uh, many of you um, have that experience as well. And then when we begin to feel these things, you know, we, we begin to ask questions. Uh, we begin to ask questions about, you know, what's, uh, what about our future? Um, uh, what does God want from us? Uh, what is, is, does God even care? Is he even, you know, paying attention? I read Bible verses about all the fun stuff that happens in heaven, and, but then down here, it's a different story. So like, are we even connecting with what's taking place? And, uh, and I recognize that sometimes I even ask the question, God, do you even care? Um, that that can be uh, somewhat crass. Uh, but yet the reality is uh, we feel those feelings at times. Say, Lord, do you even care? Do you, are you even aware of what's going on? And and, uh, uh, and what, do, you, do you have something to say to us um, in terms of your people and what our response is? And so um, the answer is yes. Uh, God does have something to say. God does care and God does have a plan. And, and, uh, and he is, as Paul says in Romans 15, he is the God of hope. And, um, and, you know, Paul also says that we are not as those who are without hope as the people of God. We have hope in light of the things that are taking place and will continue to take place. Daniel chapter 7, verse 2, the prophet Daniel, he is in Babylon, and it says that Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now, we don't have time to, uh, to actually develop the idea of the great sea, except to say that in the scripture, when it talks about the great sea, uh, many believe that it's referring to the nations. And so what Daniel is seeing, he's seeing this vision in the night, and he sees this divine activity, he sees activity coming from heaven, and it's touching the great sea. Uh, the, the seas are, are stirring up. Uh, before Esther and I uh, moved to Kansas City, we uh, used to live in, in Florida. You know, in Florida, they have hurricane season. And... Um, one of the things that I was always intriguing to me was that, you know, several days before the hurricane would hit shore, you could already tell by the way that the ocean was behaving that there was a storm on the horizon. Now, of course, the weather channel would tell us that it was coming, but, but if the weather channel wasn't there, we could, you, you, you should be able to tell by what is happening with the ocean uh, that there's a storm on the horizon. And even so, you know, uh, spiritually speaking, there, there is a storm that's on the horizon, and, and the, the things that are happening in the nations, the things that happen in America as a nation, and the things that are happening in the nations of the earth, to me are an indicator that there's something that is on the horizon that is an, um, and that's going to be very dynamic, very unique um, in, terms of, in, uh, in, in terms of human history. And so there is this stirring that is taking place. Now, this stirring... Um, actually uh, manifests itself in, uh, in various ways. I just want to mention a couple of them. One is, is, the, is the, in the realm of morality. Just as we're seeing uh, greater confusion, greater uh, 
a, a, a compromise, uh, a, a greater decline with regards to the issue of morality, uh, not just in this nation, but again, across the world. Uh, all the, it, it is an indicator that the sea is getting stirred. And then we also have the political arena. The political arena is quite um, stirred up. It's quite agitated. Again, whether politics in America, whether politics um, in the nations, there's a... Uh, 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 Different ones have clarity, but many people that I've, I've spoken with just have a real sense of confusion. In fact, even this morning, I received an email from someone saying, hey, what in the world is going on? And, and just brought up some concerns. And so there's, there's confusion and things are getting muddied. And in particular for us as Americans, that is, that's very personal because, because of the, uh, the power that we have as a people to elect uh, 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 different individuals for uh, for office, whether it's locally or, or federally, uh, we are actively involved, and 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 oftentimes our vote is our is our conscience. And so there's a lots of questions that different people are having. And again, uh, we're also having it on on the in a, on a global scene as well. And uh, you know, Turkey just had there was an attempt at military coup, and just the confusion that that's creating, and the dynamics that is taking place. Um, in, uh, in, in Europe, and then you've got Britain removing itself from the European Union and, and, the, and the whole realm of opinions that are there and what does it mean for us and what does it mean for Europe, what does it mean for the world, what does it mean for global economy and so forth, which is the other area that gets stirred up is the economic realm. Uh, there's lots of questions about the economic realm. You know, some are saying it's all good, some saying it's all bad. I mean, I mean again, there's just this clash of opinions and ideas and Whatnot, and so there's a sense of, oh, we're not quite sure what's happening and, and where things are going. And then militarily, there are issues. You know, the, Jesus uh, speaks of wars and of rumors of wars. And uh, uh, of course, we have the, the, uh, the growing threat of terror on our own soil and, and in the nations. And, and, and again, all these are, I believe, some real manifestations of what it looks like for the four winds of heaven to, uh, to stir up the sea. And when the sea gets stirred, it, it really is speaking of a crisis that is emerging um, in the nations and it's happening under God's leadership. And then and on, the, on the societal level, there are issues. We have the, the growing racial tension uh, that is happening um, in, uh, uh, in this nation, but not only in this nation. Again, it's, it's worldwide. Jesus made it very clear in Matthew 24. He said, look, he says, nation will rise against nation. Uh, the word there is ethnos, from which we get the word ethnic group. And Jesus made it very clear. He, he says, ethnic groups will rise against ethnic groups. And, uh, and so we're seeing these things uh, unfold and um, and then of course there is the uh, uh, the rapid rise though it's still on a low level but the rapid rise of anti-Semitism that uh, that's emerging in in various ways and so the point is is that things are stirring and uh, and not only are things stirring inside and we're stirred up <laughs> we're stirred up uh, on the inside and and different ones are more and, uh, vocal about them being themselves being stirred up others are being more internal, but the fact is we are, we're all stirred up in, in all kinds of different ways. And, uh, and, and then in that stirring, you know, it comes the question, hey, uh, what about the future? Is there even a, is there a bright future in front of us? And, and I want to say that there is, we do have a bright future. And, uh, but the question of the future is really the question of today. In other words, when we're asking the question, is there a future, really the question that we're asking ourselves is, whether or not what we do today doesn't actually matter. See, because if we don't have a future, then like Paul says, we might as well just eat, drink, and marry, for tomorrow we die. So when we're talking about the subject of hope, we're talking about the, uh, uh, the confidence that we have towards the future. Um, we use the word hope a lot, but oftentimes when we use the word hope, we use it to mean, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's where it's wishful thinking. But the true meaning of hope is that we actually have confidence with regards to the future. And I want to be very specific. When I'm talking about the future, I really am talking specifically about the future of those who are the people of God. There are only those who are uh, the people of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that are a people who are 
as though, uh, that we are not as those who are without hope. Rather, we are a people who have an assurance, a divinely given assurance from the Word of God, from heaven, that everything will be all right. And so in the midst of Daniel seeing the stirring of this sea, in verse 13, he continues to have this vision, and it says that, that he was watching in a night vision, so he's having this vision, he's seeing the stirring of the seas, and as the seas are stirring, he's seeing these, these, uh, uh, these different political and social things that are emerging in the stirring of the seas, and as he's watching this, in the midst of him watching this, he says that, behold, he goes, suddenly, boom, there was one like the Son of Man, and we know that who he saw was Jesus. He didn't know that it was Jesus, but Jesus said that it was Jesus. <laughs> you know, when he called himself the Son of Man uh, several times in the gospel, he says, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And to him, the, the Son of Man, he's being, there, here's this man who's being brought before him, is being brought before the Ancient of Days, or specifically, he's being brought before the Father, that God the Father had appointed this man. And in verse 14, it says that, that then to him, to this man, was given dominion. To him was given glory. To him was given a kingdom. In other words, God has, in the midst of the crisis, he, he appoints this man, his own darling son, the son, uh, the son of God, the eternal son of God who becomes a man. God appoints him. He says, son, in your humanity, I'm going to give you a kingdom. And this kingdom will last forever. And you will establish this kingdom. I will give you dominion. In other words, I'm going to give you authority. I'm going to give you a kingdom. I'm going to give you leadership to administrate my purposes in the earth, and I'm going to give you great glory, and I'm going to give you great honor. And so as we go forward in the midst of everything that is going, uh, that is going on, beloved, if, if there's anything that we want to do um, in this hour is we must set our eyes on Jesus. I realize that in many ways that can sound simplistic, but how many of you know that when things are chaotic, we want it simple? And the simple thing is that we want to set our eyes on the Lord. Now, I understand what it's like. There, there are times when I'm so overwhelmed just about, you know, whatever is life, that the last thing I want to do is set my eyes on Jesus. Because it takes work when we are weighed down with concern. It, it takes work to, uh, to, to change the focus of our hearts, and the way we change the focus of our heart is we actually change the conversation of our heart. That's actually how we change the focus. We change the conversation, we change the internal dialogue, and we direct our attention to talking to a person. When we're talking about setting our eyes on Jesus, what we mean by that is we mean that we set our eyes on his person in terms of who he is and who he says that he is, and and in this morning, he says, I am the God of hope, that we come into agreement with that. Number one, number two, that we set our sights on the fact that this God of hope has a very clearly outlined specific plan that he formed and fashioned in his heart before the world began. You know, one of the things that we uh, tell people when we evangelize, we tell them God has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, beloved, it's true. God really has a wonderful plan for our lives. Well, in the midst of the crisis, it's time to believe that he has a wonderful plan for our lives. He really has a glorious plan, and, and the Scripture is full of information about this plan. He's not making it up as we go along. No, he has a clear plan determined and formed and fashioned in his heart. Part of this plan is to establish his kingdom on the earth and to manifest the fullness of his power and his glory in every sphere of society. So Daniel, he sees the Son of Man in the midst of the crisis, indicating to us that, that in the midst of the storm, we want to set our sights on Jesus Christ. 
When I first uh, became a believer, I was uh, 14 years old. I was at his youth group and they taught us this song. It's a cheesy song. Um, it's not, you know, the cool, it's kind of like on a scale of one to five, it's a one on the cool, on the cool factor. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but I found myself singing the song in my heart a lot, a lot lately. I, I'm gonna give you the lyrics. Uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna sing it for you. Uh, you are an, uh, not ready for that kind of level. My singing voice has the ability to attract lots of power, and we're not ready for that yet. No, just uh, kidding. No, and, uh, but I will give you the lyrics, and some of you may have heard the lyrics. It goes like this. When Jesus is in the boat, you can smile at the storm. When Jesus is, I mean, I was 14 years old, a very dorky little song, but in the last month or so, that song has been in my heart, that that with Jesus in the boat, in other words, with Jesus being with us and Jesus being near us, though there is a storm that is emerging, we can smile at the storm. And there is a storm that is emerging, but we are not as those who are without hope. So in Daniel chapter 7, verse 18, the prophet continues, and he sees that the saints of the Most High God, they receive the kingdom. So not only is there the Son of Man who has been given the kingdom by the Father to establish it and to reign forever. It says that now the saints of the Most High, in other words, born-again believers, you and I, those who are called uh, by his name, we will receive that kingdom. Not only that, we will possess the kingdom forever. And what that means is that we will have ownership. We will have, we will be fully invested in the kingdom and we will be fully a part of the process of the advancement of that kingdom. But the thing that Daniel says several times in Daniel chapter 7 is that this kingdom is, I love it over here, it says this kingdom is forever, even forever and ever. It's like, wow, I mean, forever is forever. But how long is forever and even forever and ever? I mean, that's like, you know, I mean, he's really driving this point home. That this kingdom, it it won't fade away. It is a kingdom that does not know an economic recession, by the way. How many of you know there is no economic recession in the kingdom of God? It's a kingdom that Paul says in Hebrews that it will not be shaken. It cannot be shaken. Therefore, we want to put the entirety, not just some, we want to put the entirety of our confidence in the leadership of Jesus Christ that he is uh, seeking to manifest in the nations of the earth. And so what we find out is that what is happening in the earth right now, what is happening in this nation, what is happening in the world, actually serves as a training ground to prepare you and I to receive and to possess this kingdom. Which, by the way, beloved, that is our ultimate hope. It is our ultimate hope that the Father gave his son a kingdom and his son has every intention of giving this kingdom to his people. I just love it. You know, the thing that is so amazing is that, you know, the prophet Daniel, he, you guys know the story, he, he, uh, he interprets, you know, the writing on the wall uh, to the Babylonian king And here's what the king says. He says, if you interpret this, he goes, I will give you up to a third of my kingdom. Then Queen Esther comes on the scene, and she has that interaction with her king, and he says this to her. He says, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Well, Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 12, he goes, all you kings are stingy. He goes, because I will give my people all of my kingdom. I will give them the whole thing to receive it and to possess it, which simply means that we will rule and reign with him, that we will be in partnership with him. We know his ways. We know his personality. We will share in his power and we will advance his purposes. We will advance his his agenda. And so Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 He says this, he says, in this you greatly rejoice that though now for a little while, he says, if 
need be. In other words, if necessary, which it kind of seems to indicate that it is necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Now, in the context of 1 Peter, the various trials that he's talking about, he's not just simply talking about our personal trials, though we can apply it to our personal trials. But in the context of 1 Peter, Peter is talking about the trials that are taking place in society at that particular time. He's specifically writing to the church in Rome, and it was pressure that was taking place. What had happened was King Nero, he wanted to rebuild Rome, and the Senate did not approve the finances for the rebuilding of Rome. So guess what he did? He hired a bunch of arsons, and he burned the city down. And after he burned the city down, he then blamed the Christians for having burned down Rome, and there was a persecution that broke out against the church. There was sort of social pressure that was taking place, and Peter says, look, he says, this pressure, I find it interesting, he says, for a little while, if need be. In other words, it actually is necessary that we would be grieved by various trials. When I look at what's been happening in the last month or so, I think of them as various trials, different kinds of trials, different kinds of sources, different things that, that impact us, even though they're a national, they impact us at a personal level. And here's what Peter says, that the genuineness of your faith, which is much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, that this faith, in other words, that instead of faith, we can say that this that our heart responds to the Lord, is what he's saying. That our faith, our heart responds to the Lord, which that response is far more precious than gold. That this commitment, that this confidence that we have in Jesus, he said is far more precious than gold, that it may be found to the praise, the honor, and the glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, look, he says, we have this response in our hearts. When you and I were born again, we had this response in our heart of love and confidence and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says, he goes, this response is so near and dear to God that if need be, he will allow and orchestrate various trials to strengthen that response in our hearts to the Lord so that we, so it can be full of praise and glory and honor at the coming of Jesus Christ, that we can present it to him. Now, one of the reasons why God cares so intensely about this baby heart response that we have for it to grow and to become strong is for one very simple reason. It is because of the intensity of the heart response that he has towards you and me. That he loves us with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so these various trials, they are about the strengthening of love in our hearts, our response to God, that the, that the confusion, the whirlwind, the, the sense of being overwhelmed, and I, I'm very familiar with it, in the midst of it, I go, Lord, I love you. I love you, strengthen my weak heart to love you. Lord, my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me into your presence where there is solace, there is confidence, there is hope, there is strength. Lead me to that rock. The, the, the pressure that is being created in our nation, the pressure that's being created in the earth, it is to drive us to increase our internal conversation with God. And so the strength in our heart responses, the prophet Moses, he said it this way, he says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. When I think about my life, I think about the life of my friends, I think about the life of my family, I imagine that one day, which is true, we will all stand before the Lord at some point in our journey. And I imagine, you know, standing before the Lord, and you know, he's, you know, he's got a real big smile on his face because he's very kind. And uh, he says, well, he goes, I've given you X number of decades on the earth. And I'm like, yeah, wow, what a ride. It was, there were some real intense moments there, but you know, thank you for those decades. And then I imagine this question. So 
What do you have for me? What do you have for me? What investment do you have for me? And may the response of our heart on that day be, here, a heart of wisdom, a heart that is chosen to have wise heart responses, a heart that has been cultivated by wise words that have been spoken, a heart that has been cultivated by wise actions that have been, uh, that have been carried out, uh, uh, even in the midst of crisis where your word was my guide and uh, uh, I, begin to get, I begin to take my cues from your word instead of taking cues from the media pundits. Where I begin to take my cues from the word instead of just from a political ideology or whatever the thing, the case may be, where the word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. You see, when we have a lantern, a flashlight with us, the flashlights are really helpful when things get dark, but the thing that's interesting about a flashlight is that it only illumines X number of steps before us. It doesn't illumine the whole path, but it gives us enough to take the next 10 steps. But each step that we take, it illumines the next step before us. And the Word of God is that way. It, it, it illumines, it, it gives us enough information to know what the next 10 steps need to be. But once we've taken those 10 steps, it illumines the path for the next 10 steps, where the Word of God becomes our guide. More than a newspaper more than the blogs, more than social media. And I love those things. I love watching the news. I watch the news all the time, every day, multiple times. I love the news. I, I learn a lot from news. I'm not saying that the news is not something we should engage in with, but I don't take my cues from the word, uh, from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from, uh, from the news, but rather take my cues from the word of God, or at least try to take my cues from the word of God. Say, Lord, what, what are you saying? Lord, what are you saying about the Muslims? Lord, I know that studies show that there's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world and that 86% of them do not know a Christian and that 37,000 of them die each day into a Christless, into a Christless eternity. That there were 100 mosque in the United States of America in 1970 and a 2100 mosque in America today. Lord, I understand the, 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 what the media is saying and the sociological, it's like, oh my gosh, okay, this is getting intense. But what is the gospel response? What is the gospel response? Well, the Lord says, you have a great commission to, uh, to share the good news of the gospel, that these people may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Where the, again, where the gospel, where the word becomes the thing that guides us as we move forward. We're not ignoring the other dynamics, those are real, but it's also this other dimension called the gospel of Jesus Christ that guides our Christian response to know how to go forward. Turn with me to Luke chapter two. And so there's hope in the midst of the crisis. God is training our hearts to respond to him in a way that's an, um, worthy of him. But in Luke chapter two, it's a familiar story. It's the, it's the Christmas passage. Luke chapter two. It says, then the angel said to them, and there's the angel talking to the shepherd. We know the story well. And the angel says, do not be afraid. And I would say that that would be a word for us today, is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. He says, for behold, I bring you good tidings, the angel said. In other words, I bring you the gospel. I bring you good news. And it's good news of great joy. Merry Christmas. Christmas comes early for me this year. Um, I don't got time till December to read this passage. I've been reading it lately, 
uh, just to get a sense of, Lord, I, I need to plumb line my heart with what's happening in the earth. I'll bring you good tidings and a, of great joy, which will be to all people. So the first question is, Lord, is there a future? The next question that we ask ourselves, Lord, what is your intention towards us? Lord, what, are, are we even on your mind? Like, are you even aware of what's going on? Do you care? What is your intention? What are you thinking? What, what are you feeling? Well, the angel tells us, he says, and this will be the sign to you. Now, when the angel talks about a sign in the Old Testament, signs were, were used to verify or to confirm a word or to confirm a promise. And so the angel says, look, I bring you a promise. I bring you good news. God has joy for all people. Now here's the sign. He goes, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And so when Jesus Christ was born, when God sent his son to become a man, when he sent his son to die, when he sent his son to be buried, when he sent his son to be raised from the dead, that was a sign to all generations that God has every intention of filling the people of faith with joy. It is absolutely amazing. Like an old preacher said, I heard this some years ago, he said, I know that a tomb is empty because my heart is full. God sent his son as a sign that we would have joy. Now, what is meant by joy? By joy is meant that the wholeness of everything, it's not just talking about laughter, it's where everything in our life is complete. And suddenly, there with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts were praising God, and they were saying, glory to God in the highest. And here they're worshiping God. They, they're magnifying God, and I love this next phrase, and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. That is the Father's intent. That is the Father's heart, is peace. It's shalom. The, the shalom, the peace of God, is not just the absence of strife, but it is the presence of something. It's the presence of everything being made right where our heart is right, our bodies are right, our relationships are right, the, the society is right. Everything uh, functions with righteousness and justice. And the angels say, we come from heaven to declare this to you. God has every intention of filling the earth with peace. And he has goodwill. He has good intentions towards the human race. And the way that humans will experience that peace and the way that they will experience that goodwill is as they turn their hearts to the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jeremiah comes on the scene in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, and he says this, God says, for I know. He goes, I am very well acquainted with the thoughts that I have towards you. The Bible says quite a bit about the thoughts of God, and one of my favorite ones is where David says that God is mindful of us. In other words, our mind, that his mind, God's mind, is full. I mean, it's completely filled with thoughts about humans. He thinks about humans all the time. His mind is filled with thoughts about humans of how to bring them into peace. And his intentions are that of goodwill. And Jeremiah says, the Lord tells Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. And they are thoughts of peace, not thoughts of evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope. And notice he doesn't say that there won't be storms along the way, but as I mentioned earlier, that for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we can smile at the storm. We can face the storm with confidence 
knowing that everything is going to be all right. The Father loves to give his people assurances in truth. He loves to assure us. He says, I want to give you a future, which means that what you do today matters. The way we respond today matters. The way that we respond in righteousness in the workplace, it, it matters because it, it continues on into the age to come. The, the fruit that we bear in that context before the Lord, it absolutely matters. The way that we respond in our family context, it, it matters. These heart responses, they all go into this bank account of a heart full of wisdom that we can present before the Lord when we stand before him on that day. He's have thoughts of peace, thoughts to give you a future, thoughts to give you hope, to give you assurances. And then he says this, and when we know that his thoughts towards us, that his intentions towards us are not up for evil, but for a future, for a peace, and for a hope, when we get convinced of that, what it does, it actually increases our desire to talk to him. I tell you, when I, when my heart gets touched with the fact that he thinks wonderful things about me according to the word, it actually gives me confidence to talk to him. And here's what the Lord tells Jeremiah. Then, once you're convinced of this, he says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. It's the same answer every time. We want to give ourselves to pray. We want to give ourselves to prayer individually. We want to give ourselves to prayer uh, uh, corporately. I love what is happening here in your midst in terms of the, the prayer meetings uh, that are happening. And I'm sure that um, uh, many more of you just in your own personal life are engaging in prayer. But as we increase the dialogue, that's where we begin to find peace and joy. So, is there a hope? The answer is yes, God has a plan. Number two, what is his intent? His intent is towards peace and goodwill, good intentions towards, towards us. So what is our mission? Well, Matthew 24, verse six, and Jesus says that, and you will hear of wars and of rumors of wars. He says, but see to it that you are not troubled. The thing that the Lord is exhorting his people through the word is do not be troubled. There's all kinds of things that take place when our hearts get troubled, when our hearts get weighed down. There's all kinds of negative things that happen inside of us. And, and the Lord knows that he's speaking to us as a tender shepherd, and he says, do not be troubled by the things that are taking place. In Matthew 24, 14, he says, but th th this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness. In other words, what he wants from us is that we would be bearers of the good news. That we would be bearers of the good news, honestly, to our own hearts, where we need to tell the good news to ourselves. Number two, do we tell the good news to our fellow believers? Because we need to remind one another of the good news. And then, sec and then thirdly, we, we share the good news with the unbelievers. That God has an answer for the racial conflict that exists within America. The gospel has much to say about it. Jesus died for racial harmony. Jesus died to tear down every wall of hostility that exists between people groups, to make them one, and that in that context, they would together experience the fullness of God's love and God's pleasure. The gospel has much to say to us about that. But for us to comfort people with the gospel, we have to cooperate with what I like to call the law of comfort, where we comfort others with the very thing that we are comforted by. And so the gospel needs to become our diet, or the word of God needs to become, an, in an increased measure, a part of our diet. It needs to become our orientation by the way that we view the world. We can't simply view the world through our favorite news channel. That's not enough. It's Anyway, it's, 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 it's not the way forward. We want to view the world through the lens as the Lord communicates it to us through the word of God. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. 
As we put our confidence in the Lord, Romans 15, 13. As we put our confidence in the Lord. The last question, will he sustain us? And the answer is yes. The God of hope will sustain our hearts. And Paul prays this. He goes, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace, but it's in the context of believing. That as we believe God and we believe his plan, Paul says there is peace and there is joy because we have a different perspective. And he says, and then when we have this perspective, it is so that we would abound with hope, where the conversation that is in our heart, the conversation that is in our thought life, it is abounding with hope and confidence that everything is going to be all right. And Paul says that this happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right now, based upon blogs and social media and the news, there is not abounding hope. There's, an, uh, there's abounding anger, there's a, and I understand, I'm very empathetic towards it. There's abounding anger, abounding fear, abounding anxiety, abounding depression, abounding lots of negative. And the Lord goes, you know what? For believers, it doesn't have to be that way. He says, I can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can cause hope to abound in our hearts. A couple years ago, when the, uh, when the Ebola situation was going on, I uh, uh, was uh, going to travel, and I'm at the airport, and I'm going through security, and, you know, you got to put your stuff in these gray bins and put them through the machine for it to be screened. And uh, I, remember <laughs> I remember grabbing one of the bins, and my first thought was, what if an Ebola person touched this bin? <laughs> And I went, oh, no. And then I thought, no, Stuart, there's not a chance of that. I mean, you know, I went all statistical in my head. And so, so I moved on. So I felt pretty good. Then I grabbed the second bin. I'm like, I know this is the one for sure. I'm having this conversation in my head. I wasn't abounding in hope. And so, and so I pushed this thing through, and I thought, no, Stuart, come on. You got to stop psyching yourself out. It's not a big deal. You're going to be okay. So then I get into the airplane. I thought, I'm sure I'm fine. And then I said, oh no, I read somewhere that it takes several hours before the symptoms come out. So now I'm like this for hours going, oh, waiting for these symptoms to show up that never showed up. Not abounding in hope. <laughs> that was an internal conversation that was reflective of lack of hope. And, uh, uh, and the Lord has a different orientation for us that we can have a different conversation that is energized by the Holy Spirit. And so I love to pray Romans 15, 13, as the worship team come up. I love to pray Romans 4, 15, 13 for my own heart and for my friends and family. Lord, would you cause our hearts to abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you're born again this morning, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and me, and he has all the power to reorient the internal dialogue to be full of confidence that God is who he says he is and that he has a glorious plan in store for his people to receive the kingdom and to possess it forever. Father, thank you, Lord, for who you are. We say that you are the God of hope. We love you. Father, I ask you that you would increase, Lord, the revelation of who you are to our hearts. Father, thank you for Grace Church. Father, thank you for the spiritual family. Thank you for what you're doing in their midst. Father, thank you that you are faithful to bring into completion every good word that you have started. Father, I ask you that you would increase it. Father, I ask you for those who are specifically wrestling with a deep sense of anxiety and despair. Father, I ask you for your tender mercy to be towards them. And Lord, that the power of hope that resides in them by the Holy Spirit. Father, that you would stir it up. That, Lord, that you would strengthen them deep on the inside by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you would even make them messengers of hope to your people and to the nations of the world. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.